CBSD with you, tutorials on gaming. This video is a strange one for me. I intended it to be one thing. I intended it to be a list of five mistakes that uh, people make when they first start using FreeBSD. But, yeah, I, I, I didn't use the script, and I was thinking off the top of my head, so it's a bit rambly. It's very long. Uh, I would suggest you either just skip to the sections that you want, you know, flip through it, and you can actually see number one, number two, you know, number five, number four, number three, number two, number one. They're not in any particular order, I'll just go down that way. And, um, yeah, so try to enjoy and remember, it, I'm not going to be doing this again. This was a rambly one. Um, it was like a combination of ramble, list, um, not really a, a moan or a whine, but a, um, a just a ramble. So, uh, see you on the other side. Before we start, if this is your first time to the channel and you would like to learn more about FreeBSD and the journey to a better desktop and server, then please hit subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out. FreeBSD can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be. And here are five common mistakes made by new users to the platform. Number five, hardware. A lot of new users to FreeBSD often assume that if they go and buy the latest uh, Wonder PC running the latest chipset, etc., that you just stick on FreeBSD and it will work as Windows does. And even Linux, which admittedly has a higher degree of hardware compatibility, will sometimes struggle with the latest developments in technology. Um, so FreeBSD, having a little bit of uh, lag behind Linux in this respect will probably not work on your latest Ryzen PC or whatever it is nowadays. Where it does shine is in hardware that is slightly older, more familiar hardware. I mean, eventually the developers on FreeBSD will catch up with the drivers and will actually uh, implement many of the the features found in modern hardware, but it just takes time. And like I said, even in Linux, where more resources are put in, especially the big commercial vendors, say for instance Ubuntu or Red Hat, even they are not always on the cutting edge of the latest stuff. So when it comes to hardware, it's really best to, I would suggest, Use anything, if you must, on pre-built systems, anything from HP or IBM or Lenovo, anything like that, they have a pretty good track record of running very well with FreeBSD. And if you go for a more independent, say, for instance, System76, now they have a fantastic track record of running Linux already pre-installed, so there's a good chance that anything by them that actually runs Linux or any other machine that actually runs Linux perfectly will probably run FreeBSD as well. The biggest problem I've noticed uh, is laptops. Now, there's a certain amount of uh, incompatibility floating around for FreeBSD and Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not perfect in Linux, and it's worse in FreeBSD. But in the case, there are some chipsets which are guaranteed uh, to work with FreeBSD. So what I would suggest is that maybe buy a separate dongle and use that as your Wi-Fi. Even better if you can, use Ethernet. Uh, but if that's not possible, then just a little tried and trusted dongle. There's a, I'll leave a link down below of a hardware compatibility page. And that will list all the chipsets and various whatnots which uh, run or are known to run with FreeBSD. With graphics cards... Um, there's not a problem with FreeBSD. I, I can't speak 100% for AMD cards. Um, I've not, I've not run one of them for years or uh, Radeon cards. I've not run one of them for years. I mainly use NVIDIA and as far as NVIDIA goes with FreeBSD, there's not a problem at all. The NVIDIA, the official uh, NVIDIA drivers on the, from the FreeBSD repositories are slightly older. Doesn't mean that they don't work. 
but they're slightly older. But you can, of course, go to the main NVIDIA website and download a, uh, a TAR package and then just run, uh, not a TAR package, just a run file. This is like a, a script. You can just do that and it will install the drivers for you. There's a little bit more work involved than just simply uh, PKG or port master in it. But if that's what you want, if you want the latest ones, the latest ones I'm running, I think it's 418, then that's that's certainly something to consider. But no, no, as far as graphics cards, are, there's really not a problem there. Sound, sound hasn't been a problem with FreeBSD for a long time. Uh, so many uh, onboard sound drivers, onboard, you know, it, it's not a problem. So hardware is, it can be an issue. Printers, sometimes printers, well, it depends on the printer. I, I really have good luck with uh, Samsung and HP. Uh, I've had a HP uh, 1020 for, oh, I don't know, five years, six years, seven years. I don't know. I've had it a long time. It's a laser printer. It, uh, it, it works flawlessly. And even if you do have problems with uh, FreeBSD accessing printers, well, one solution would be, I don't know, it's not ideal, but get a little Raspberry Pi, bung um, Raspbian on it, and use that as a printer server. It's minimal power, and you could access it using cups. So that's the solution. Um, so, yeah, there's that. Keyboard and mouse, of course, there's never no problem there. But again, it's all about if you resource your hardware, uh, do a little bit of homework, um, just check overall before taking the plunge into FreeBSD, you will find that if, say, for instance, you want to build your own system, you make sure the parts, just ch check the, the database and ask about on the FreeBSD forums. Hell, you can even come on this channel and ask. You can put together a system that will be fast, reliable, and will run FreeBSD just perfectly. Number four, hand-holding. FreeBSD, like some flavors of Linux, uh, use the command line a lot. There are some Linux distributions which keep the command line and the terminal to a, to a minimum. Um, but FreeBSD has never forgotten its Unix roots, and that in the sense uh, that the terminal is an essential part. So right from the get-go, if as soon as you've installed FreeBSD, you will just get a terminal session. It was just flashing cursor, you log in, that's it. And that can be extremely off-putting. Um, but that's its strength because it allows you to, you learn, you can learn and grow and develop your skills with FreeBSD. And not just FreeBSD, if you learn it on FreeBSD, then you can transfer, they're easily transferable skills into Linux. There's very, the similarities between the two are, are extraordinarily close. There are key differences, of course, um, directory structures, some commands, you know, little things. The philosophy behind them can differ too. Uh, FreeBSD, to a certain extent, is very much, um, it's still Unix at heart. Um, it has an indirect heritage of over 40 years. But even though it was officially named uh, FreeBSD, 26 years ago, it has a heritage much much longer than that. And it's never forgotten these roots. And as such, there's very, uh, what is that? So no, no Windows creep, as it were. No Windows S creep. And what I mean by that is, uh, I remember when I first, when many, many years ago when I used um, Mandrake Linux, yeah, I thought it was wonderful. I was just starting to learn about Linux. I tried to install uh, Red Hat previously, and that that, that it never went well. But when Mandrake came along, oh my goodness me, it, it 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 did everything for you. It it literally did hold your hand. It made it made Linux so accessible that even someone with no experience could just pop in the CD DVD, load it up, and install. It was brilliant. And of course, then later on, Ubuntu then you know, filled them shoes left thick when uh, Mandrake was no longer around or no longer what it used to be. But you don't get that FreeBSD. FreeBSD, you install the base, and on top of that, you can then install the things that you need and leave out the stuff that you don't. 
you know, people, I've heard people extol virtues of, of Arch, etc. And while Arch, you know, it may be great, it looks really overly complicated to install. It's like you put loads of effort in to get, in my opinion, not much back. 3BSD, in my opinion, gives you a nice medium. The install is not so difficult once you get used to it. And once you do, and once you actually get past the initial, oh, well, you know, you don't do, this is strange, you don't do it like this, you don't do it like that. Once you get past that, it gives you the power and the freedom to um, create what you want, the system that you want, without all that, the, the hassle and the headache of, of what Arch may be. I know I've never installed Arch, and I really have no interest. And such, because you can build the system up yourself, there's no software center. Uh, the, the, the one of the one of the most, for me personally, looking in the Linux world, one of the most irritating things was, oh, it was fine at the beginning, I suppose, in one or two of the um, user-friendly distributions of Linux, but the software center really started to irritate me because Synaptic was always a perfect uh, to me. If you wanted a GUI uh, package manager, Synaptic was not wrong. There's not wrong with it. You know, say for instance Debian, which I used to be I used to use Debian and enjoyed it greatly. Apt get on the command line is brilliant. It does everything you need. It's very powerful. If you didn't like that, I mean you wanted a GUI uh, alternative, then Synaptic w was your best bet. And but for some people and I don't know when this happened or why this happened, but for some people that wasn't enough. It wasn't friendly enough it wasn't disneyfied enough it wasn't uh cartoonish enough and suddenly you got the the welcome screen and software center bundled together and i don't see the point because it's not so difficult just to fire up synaptic and then just search what you want I anyway they that, you know that's not that's not for me that's design choices by the people who made the distros and that's fine but yeah people who, who perhaps come to freebsd expect it to automatically uh have installed everything for you yeah, a, a nice little uh desktop environment pops up and then they expect the software center to zoom into the to the faces and that's not going to happen and it doesn't happen as far as help goes uh the freebsd forums i you know, some people may complain that perhaps they're a bit elitist or they're a little bit dismissive the FreeBSD forums is a great source of help, uh, and the people on there are some of the cleverest people that you'll ever meet. But the the rules of the forums are that uh, see for me it doesn't matter, but for them it does, and it keeps an orderly house, uh, you know, an orderly ship. The, you have to format your question properly and ask it in a professional manner. Everything's very professional. And so if you ask it in the right way and you're courteous and the question is clear, you will get a clear and courteous answer. If you, if your answer is, if your question is, you know, I don't know, why is, why is FreeBSD rubbish and why can't I do this? Then you will either get ignored. And this is the same as I, you know, IRC. It's, you know, you will either get ignored or you'll get a terse answer asking you to um, rephrase it. And, and I have not a problem with that. Because then it does get you into a certain mindset of um, thinking about what the problem is and how you ask the questions. It's, it's Otherwise, you get chaos. And for some new users, they may think that no help is available because they've gone to this uh, forum and, and, and in their minds been treated this way. But it's really not the case. And besides, there's plenty of other help available if you don't wish. You can go on my, this channel, for instance. I'll try and help you the best I can. Um, if I don't know the answer, then I'll try and look it up for you. And I'll 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 spend a good few hours looking at all the source material and everything I can to try and find you the answer. And even if that you don't want to do that, then there is a source of uh, of of help available in all three BSDs. There, it's in uh, Linux as well, and something which is I don't know, kind of overlooked. It's perhaps it's not flashy enough, perhaps it's not sexy enough. Um, but that is the man pages or the manual pages. They're, they're a source of help which 
almost everything about your system has got a little man page about it which will then clue you in how to use it, the, the syntax, and, and all the rest. So while FreeBSD doesn't hold your hand, it can provide you signposts in which to find the answers that you want. And I think, finally, FreeBSD is not GhostBSD. Many people will go get FreeBSD, they'll load it up, and be completely shocked that it's not Linuxy enough for them. A GhostBSD... I've had an on and off kind of uh, relationship with them for a while. I some of my earlier reviews of the system is probably not, I, I'm not going to endear myself to the FreeBSD developers. I'm not going to. They've not come on my channel saying, "Oh, fantastic review," because I think uh, you know some of my earlier reviews were less than flattering, and the reason for that was I was always a little bit skeptical about how you were trying to uh, Ubuntuize, for a better word, FreeBSD try to turn it into something it's not. Something it promises something that it can never deliver. And as good as FreeBSD is, and as good as uh, GhostBSD is, it can never be Ubuntu. It can never be Windows. In the same way that, yeah, in the same way that Ubuntu can never be Windows. GhostBSD can never be Ubuntu. It's just, it's a different environment. And you have to think in a certain way when you approach FreeBSD. It's more logically laid out. It's more it's more true to the Unix way, um, but GhostBSD tries. There's nothing wrong with the project. I, I do ingra greatly enjoy the uh, later versions, but they they try to promise uh, new Linux users a Linux way of doing things in the in the BSD world, and it doesn't always work. For instance, you're not going to find the same support for Steam or Netflix. Or the AAA games. Not I don't know what is available for Linux on uh, AAA games, but you certainly won't find them on FreeBSD, and certainly not GhostBSD. So GhostBSD might look the part, loads up very nice, but when it comes to it, a new Linux user will not find the same experience. So FreeBSD is not GhostBSD. FreeBSD is a base system. Once you install it, it's for yours to assemble. So it doesn't hold your hand. Doesn't assume you're an idiot. Gives you loads of choices. If you just want, if you don't want to go in, you just want a uh, command line operating system with all the uh, you know end cursors, tools, etc. You can have that. It's not a problem. I've done that. I have servers running which doesn't have a GUI on it. Some people may say, "Oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a GUI on the server." I I disagree. I think you can have a web server that will serve out a you know like web page command thing to remote clients. But I don't think the server itself needs a GUI, needs a, a desktop. It, does, it doesn't, I don't think it does. So that it can do that. And FreeBSD makes an excellent desktop. But you have to work at it. You have to do a little bit of tweaking. And that's all part of it. It's, it. it's just, that's what I love about it. Once it's done, it's done. I have this system that, I've, uh, that I use now as my main desktop. And I'll I'll do a assist I'll do a kind of like desktop setup a walkthrough video in a bit because I've had the channel for two years and one of my practically the first video that I ever did on this channel was I did a, a quick rundown of the desktop I use uh, using Motif Window Manager on I think it might be in FreeBSD eleven or FreeBSD eleven point one I can't remember but nothing's changed my desktop is the same as it was two years ago the menu obviously changes you know you add things take things away. But I have upgraded from 11, 11.1, 11.2. 11.2 went a bit funny, you know. But then I then upgraded to 12, and that's it. My system works perfectly. It's got them set up the way I want it to be. No one held my hand to do it. I worked it all out myself, and it's a great experience to learn it to to learn it yourself. So yeah, FreeBSD is not GhostBSD. There's plenty of help available. The Unix way, using man pages, and on the forums as well. There's no software center needed. We'll get into the package management uh, later on in the video, but there's no software center needed. You don't need no one to show you nice pretty pictures. If you know what software is and you know what it does, and if you're coming to FreeBSD from Linux, then you will know what you're wanting or what stuff you use. And then FreeBSD uses the command line a lot. It hasn't forgotten its Unix roots, and there's no Windows creep. And that says it all, really. Number three, expecting Windows or Linux. 
this kind of ties in as well to the uh, the previous one, number four, in the sense that a lot of new users to FreeBSD expect a computer that runs Windows or Linux to just work. And again, you know, it ties into number five. It's the down with hardware. Many stuff in FreeBSD does work. It does work perfectly. Uh, I've really never had a problem, like I say, apart from scanners and printers. But, you know, it's not a major problem. There's always a solution available. And I think if you come to FreeBSD, you have a certain reason to come to FreeBSD. And if that reason is strong enough, you can do it out of curiosity, sure, but if you have a reason, like a philosophical reason or a, a practical reason, if you have a reason to come to FreeBSD, then something like the printer or the scanner not working, you will either forgive and just move on and do something else, or you'll find a solution. I have a solution in FreeBSD, if you're good at coding, or a solution by, say, for instance, using a a scanner server or a printer server. And that's that's what I did. If you really want to use FreeBSD, you will find a way to use it. If your Wi-Fi doesn't work, get a dongle or use Ethernet. I only use Ethernet. There's always a way. So expecting a computer that runs Windows or Linux to just work, isn't it? you might be lucky. You have a, I don't know, 80% chance, 80 to 20. But again, not every Linux distribution will work straight out of the thing for every new piece of hardware or for any computer. Computer that runs Windows fantastically, put Linux on it, there may be a problem with video, problem with sound. It just might not work. I've got um, my main system here uh, is an AMD FX 8350, I think. It's got 32 gigabytes of RAM, uh, DDR3. It's nothing fantastic. It's eight cores. It, it's not a, a weedy computer by any stretch. But there are some... I've tried a... I want to, yeah, I tried a, a Linux uh, live DVD, uh, came on a magazine, I think, a couple of weeks back. Wouldn't do it. It just wouldn't work. It wouldn't boot up, black screen, nothing. And this is with a, a nice uh, NVIDIA card. I can't remember the, I think they're like um, 750 or something like that. It just wouldn't work with it. With FreeBSD, I never had no problem. So, And then again, I tried another Linux distro, and that worked. So... Even with Linux, there's a certain degree of uh, hit and miss. And with FreeBSD, that is. So expecting a computer that runs Windows or Linux to just work is not going to happen. Again, almost tying into the to the um, number five is hardware and expecting it to work. FreeBSD isn't Linux and it's not Windows. And again, it's to do with drivers. Windows will have the latest drivers. Some of them drivers are pretty messed up from the manufacturers themselves, OEM discs. Linux will have slightly more drivers already being built in, especially if they're open source or back engineered for whatever, you know, reverse engineered. And FreeBSD probably won't. So what might work on the Linux won't necessarily work in FreeBSD and what might work in Windows won't necessarily work in Linux. You have to approach each one with a an open mind and a new perspective. I, I've had a few comments over the times uh, suggesting that maybe, you know, uh, can, can FreeBSD play games? Can FreeBSD, uh, can FreeBSD run Netflix and, well, oh, Ubuntu can or oh, Red Hat can and stuff like that. And well, then fine, they can. And that's brilliant. You know, I would suggest if they you value them things, then use them. Uh, but I pointed out to these people that AAA games run by Windows, does that run on your Linux? And I get silence. And cause the answer is no. If you want a truly... 100% user-friendly, <clears throat> well, I mean, that's that's debatable, user-friendly experience with compatibility and the latest things, viruses, of course, then run Windows. Many of the gamers and streamers on Twitch uh, actually run win uh, Windows for a reason, a wider choice of games and, and hardware. Then brilliant, run Windows. I, I have nothing against Windows. Some people vehemently hate Windows. I don't hate Windows. I actually think that Windows 10 is, I'm probably in minority here, but Windows 10 is fairly... It's fairly decent. It's not bad. Certainly better than Windows 8. Windows 7 and Windows 2000 are my favourites. And if you want a, a, a happy medium of uh, more games available, Steam, Client, Netflix, uh, lack of viruses, stability, then run Linux. But each one of these particular operating systems, you have to have a mindset of 
why you're using it and what you expect out of it. You know, I was worst thing in the world is like a Windows user goes over to Linux and berates Linux because it can't do this, it doesn't do that, it hasn't got this. Not understanding that you've made a conscious choice to move over to Linux, a completely different operating system. And it's the same way to FreeBSD. FreeBSD will do, it will behave wonderfully for you. You will have a system that is stable. They don't make uh, outlandish choices. <coughs> Ubuntu. They do things very conservatively. They don't change for change sake. Things will move very slow. If you're, you like the cutting edge and bleeding edge and brilliant and FreeBSD is not going to be the one for you. They, You can have access to some of the latest software via ports, of course, if you use it, if you, you know, you follow the latest uh, branch. And that will give you the latest uh, software and applications if you need it. But FreeBSD itself moves slowly. Very, very few changes are introduced for change sake. Just that you have to roll your sleeves up do a little bit of digging and also thinking that FreeBSD can be a, a Linux alternative well it can be but it's not Linux in the sense that um, while there is a very active community it's not on the same scale as what's available for Linux um, it, it's just not the way it is FreeBSD is something which is chosen by the big companies to use you know Netflix and PlayStation and all the usual ones. They they chose FreeBSD for its licensing, its freedom. Uh, the FreeBSD license is extremely permissive. The GPL2 and the GPL3, uh, GPL3 almost not really universally liked, but the GPL2, that require you to uh, make the source available and any changes that you do to the source then has to be passed on and made available to everyone else. And companies tend not to uh, if they if they enhance the Linux a bit, add some things to it, and they have to make that available, they're kind of like re reticent, really. It's like, mm, you know, we, we don't want to. With FreeBSD, you don't have to do that. FreeBSD uh, has a license, which means that as long as you credit, you know, it's like a two two line license or a three point license, it depends on which version. That if you credit the FreeBSD developers and put the copyright at the beginning, then basically that's fine. That's all you need. You don't need to distribute the code again if you don't need to. You can, as a company, you can take the FreeBSD code, you can enhance it with all the latest dingly danglies, package it in as your product. <laughs> fine. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, I think that's the fundamental difference between FreeBSD and Linux, and obviously Windows, of course, that you don't have to distribute the code. You can if you want, and companies like Sony uh, have, and Apple to a certain extent, have contributed back into the ecosystem because it benefits them in the end. If they, if they make any changes and they make things run a bit smoother, then it, 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 they, they put stuff back and it feeds back to them anyway. I mean, even Microsoft. Microsoft um, made some changes to, I think it was like 3BSD 10.3, they made some changes uh, to FreeBSD 10.3, improved its netcode um, for their Azure uh, platform. And that's the bizarre thing about that one is actually um, FreeBSD had excellent netcode. It always has done, better than Linux. And Microsoft originally took that uh, as far as, as, as the basis for their earlier Windows uh, uh, releases, the actual netcode from FreeBSD, who then <laughs> updated it and then fed it back into FreeBSD later. So, it's, you know. so yes, you can contribute back if you wish. And even if you don't wish, if you made some changes, which yeah, we don't want to release it, they, they contribute financially. And uh, Netflix has um, been very generous um, to FreeBSD uh, Foundation over the years. So yeah, there are a lot of similarities between FreeBSD and Linux, but FreeBSD is not Linux. Uh, not Linux in the size of the of the user base. It's not Linux in the uh, restrictive nature of the license. Uh, it's not Linux or Windows in the sense that uh, you have access to all the Netflix and um, 
triple A games. But I will, I managed to get Steam working on uh, FreeBSD. It's not a problem, and that's really not that much different to what's available now um, on Linux regarding Steam. It's not that much different. So yeah, FreeBSD is not Linux in the same way that Linux is not Windows. It can be a philosophical reason for you to change, but you have to think differently. Oh, and that's a, a slogan from a well-known company, isn't it? Think differently. Number two, giving up. Now, now this is a funny one because I... Um, New experiences can be daunting, and you can... Uh, and I speak from personal experience here, that I used to... When I first started out with FreeBSD, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. I, you know, I bunged in the, you know, the CD, the DVD, and I installed it. It's like, what the hell is this? This didn't do this. Wipe this. Stop that. That didn't work. And Do you know, I, I, I'd run back to Linux, and... Similarly, when I was going from Windows to Linux, I, I, I would do the same thing. I'd run back to Windows if things didn't work in Linux. That's, it's a natural thing. You think, I can't be bothered with this. And you go back to your comfort zone. And the temptation uh, to um, do that in an age of distro hopping is is high. Say, for instance, for whatever reason, you no longer want to use Windows. That's fine. You know, like, you know, it's good to move on. And you find Linux. You find a distro which you really like, and it's easy and everything works. It's brilliant. Just stay out of the box. Everything. There's no terminal. There's no installation that you can see. You just point, click, 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 and it's installed. Brilliant. But maybe it's not the stable, uh, not the most stablest of operating system. Maybe it keeps on crashing. Maybe. They haven't got the latest browser. You know, everything else is really nice, looks fantastic and, you know, almost Windows and it's theming and stuff like that. And they don't have this or they don't have that. And you start to get cheesed off. So you distro hop to a new one and, and then you keep on hopping and hopping and hopping until eventually you want to get work done. You've got to get work done. You can't keep wiping it off and reinstalling and, and backing up. It's like, ah. So you think, oh, well, I'm going to try FreeBSD. And then you have this, this wonderful stable operating system that moves at the speed of a glacier, but you know provides stability and security, and uh, you can get work done on it. But I mean, I, and this is a big but it it doesn't quite do what you want it to do. You plug in a USB stick, no pops up. You think, mm, okay, you want to watch something, it won't play the video. All these things are actually achievable once you dig into it. But not out of the box. Not even when you first install a uh, uh, a desktop environment. And so you start to get bitter. You start to think, well, I'm not doing this. I want to go back to Linux. It worked on Linux. And so they do. You just load in and you, either the same distribution that which you came over from or a new one. And this new one is full of bells and whistles and it's all glossy and lovely and everything's shiny and it's just, oh, it's got wallpapers and icons and it's just, and that's sometimes, I when I see reviews of Linux, that's all, it's got lovely wallpaper, it's got lovely icons. Oh my goodness me, you're looking at the desktop environment, not the operating system. The operating system doesn't have desktop and icons. Oh well, and wallpapers. So anyway, you go back to that. And then you do a bit more hopping. Then you get, again, cheesed off and you come back to Linux. So in an age of distro hopping, it's so much easier just to run. I think for me, um, I found it easy just to, I, th I can't remember back now, but I think I just like, it's a certain thing, it's like you burn your bridges. I, I can't, not britches, bridges. In this case, the Americans are listening. I don't burn your pants. And you kind of, you, there's no going back. Do you know what I mean? It kind of like, I thought, ah, to hell with this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this. So on my main piece, I back, obviously I backed up all my information and, and text files and receipts and pictures and whatnot. I reformatted the drive uh, into UFS. 
imported everything back into again, into again. And I jolly well learnt it because I had no choice. I didn't have any other uh, DVDs. I got rid of my ISOs. I got rid of uh, any install media. It was it was either Windows, it was FreeBSD, and I wanted to use FreeBSD at the time. And I learnt it. I actually rolled up my sleeves and learnt it. And then it, it became easier. I understood how things were slotted together, how this worked and why that didn't work. But if you did this, he made that work and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Again, as I alluded to in the previous one, there's many sources of help for FreeBSD. Many sources of help. Other users are the greatest source of it. You know, many subscribers to this channel, users on the FreeBSD forums, they are an immense resource. Huge resource that you can take advantage of. Not use, in, not in the bad sense, but they're there. They'll offer the information and the help and the life experiences free for nothing. And there's nothing like asking people who have actually been there and done it. What do you think? This is what happened. What did you do? Et cetera, et cetera. You don't... Re I don't know. I'm speaking generally here, but uh, you don't... There's no sense of community in Windows, it seems like it. I mean, there probably is, but it's not that I've noticed. There's plenty of information around, of course, official information, books and whatever. But when it comes to solid community, there doesn't seem to be that much there. There's no... Uh, cohesive community as such. Linux is really much is a community, and um, again, I don't. I'm not sure about the book wise or inform official information. Again, you see, because there's so many different Linux distributions, uh, information can be. It, it might not apply to one. To, it might not apply to that. Yeah, this is what is a great advantage to FreeBSD. Free, there's only one FreeBSD. I oh, know you got GhostBSD and all, but there, there's one FreeBSD. They're called GhostBSD, that's called NetBSD, that's called OpenBSD. They're not, that's not FreeBSD. You don't get FreeBSD Lite or Ubuntu FreeBSD. And you, you get FreeBSD. So any information that you're searching for FreeBSD is only about FreeBSD. And the handbook has some of the best information. Some of it can be a little bit older. And I might actually offer my services to update it. But it contains everything you need and it just pertains to FreeBSD. And of course, you've got man pages, as mentioned earlier. But the biggest philosophy, I, I think, is that if you learn once, either learn Windows, then learn Linux, you can learn again. We're not incapable. None of us are incapable of learning something. You know, they're old, old, you know, so like uh, Tom of being, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nonsense. You can learn anything at any age. Human races constantly learn and relearn and relearn again throughout the ages to do things. Of course, if we didn't, we'd be stagnating right now. Some say we are, but, you know, that's a different thing. So you can learn it. You can learn the operating system. You can learn the installation. And once you've learned it enough, once you've gone to the old uh, memory in the head, it comes to second nature to you. It really does. It's um, it's a strange thing when I see people, either in videos or coming to them online, that they find that the idea of using the terminal is difficult. I mean, my goodness me, you know, I I'm old enough and ugly enough to. I I was there the the, the sort of like the start of the home computer revolution, uh, especially in the UK. We had we had a huge range of computers, a wonderful wonderful system, and you switched them on. Nothing happened. You just got it, beep, and then it would just get this flashing cursor, usually sometimes with an OK above it, or a ready, depends on your system, the BBC Micro, I think. Or. And it didn't do anything until you either put in a special keyword or you loaded up a game or you, you typed in your program, then saved it in, in basic. It didn't do anything. It didn't hold your hand. It, it, didn't, it didn't do any of these things. But we didn't give up. We... We just, you got on with it. You learned it. And even if it was only a matter of, uh, you know, if it was only a matter of becoming very proficient in how to load up Frogger, you still remember the commands. I think on the Dragon 32, it was, uh, uh, it was either C load for uh, cassette load, uh, or D load for disk load, 
and you put an M on it for machine code loading. So it was either basic uh, or machine code, either from the disc or cassette. See, even now I remember that. I think the BBC Micro, I think it was um, asterisk chain. I could be wrong on that, or chain M or something like that. Yeah, so I do remember. You do, you do learn. I think, I think people forget. Along came Windows, point and click. No longer need to learn these things. And to a certain extent, become mollycoddled. Now, Linux, some Linux anyway, and FreeBSD certainly, they drop you into the old school, old mentality. And for some people, it's going to be difficult going back. You used to point, it's like if you used to make all your own meals, which I do, and then you get used to eating ready meals in the microwave, and then something happens to uh, the microwave, you have to then use your meal, make your meals again. Someone's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Because like, you forget. But it's there, and you're capable of learning it again. If you learned it before, you can learn it again. And and that's that's how I look at it. There's nothing worse, there's nothing more head-scratching to me to see people who, who they just they refuse, you know, oh, it's got terminal on it, or I don't know how to fix this, and, and they give up. You give up, you're never going to learn if you give up. Goodness me. But once you do learn, there's a whole world out there of things that you can, like I say, transferable skills from FreeBSD, to Linux, there you go, and vice versa. If, you, if you're of the mindset to learn these things in Linux, then you'll fit on FreeBSD just fine. If, again, if you fit in FreeBSD, you know, you learn these things, then you can move back to Linux in a more advanced level. You almost like, imagine FreeBSD is almost like a, a teacher. It will teach you how to do things the unix way, you know. So you might start out on a nice, uh, hand-holding, friendly, GUI Linux. You think, oh, I've had enough of this, I'm going to go on to uh, FreeBSD. You learn FreeBSD. Then you think, oh, well, actually, you know, I think I'll go back to Linux. But then you'll go back to Arch Linux or some other so-called harder distros. And you wouldn't have done that if you hadn't have gotten a FreeBSD. And that's just, you know, that's what I've, I've seen people do that. So, right, and that brings us on to the final one, which is package management. Again, it's all tied. It's all tied together. The package management in, in uh, Windows, if this is... What you tend to do is for the latest software, you'll go to the actual um, the developer's homepage, download it, install it, and hopefully it works and hopefully it affects your system. Um, of course, there's a, the Microsoft Store. Oh, I, believe, I don't think that's what you call it. There's not a right lot on there. It's not fantastic. Uh, regarding Linux, you've got all the various uh, repositories for the various distros, you know, it's, and then you've got Snaps. Oh, Snaps and... Um, Whichever the ones over ones are called, but they're all based upon the same thing. Absolutely terrible. And PPAs as well. Oh, my goodness. The number of users I've seen use PPAs or um, there's, there's a distro. I don't, I don't want to name him. I don't want to name his distro, but the theme in is, is basically nearly all white and it looks like Windows. Yeah, it's got a little bird as a... It's got a little bird as its logo. Oh my goodness, that particular distribution is so cram-packed full of PPAs. I don't even know, I don't suppose he, he even, I, I don't suppose, oh, nearly swore then, I don't suppose that he even knows what is in it. That he probably loses track of himself of what is installed. And that's in order to get all the themes and various uh, little bits that he needs to make the distribution look the way it does and behave in the way it does. And you know, that is such a, it really is a security risk. Um, if someone puts something malicious in there and, and you wouldn't know you know the number of websites where it's it, you know it says just copy this and they want you to blindly copy it in and, and why why would you do that you know and it's, it, I wouldn't I wouldn't just personally go in and, and download any old Windows thing because you know you're gonna, probably going to get a virus really in the same way that some PPAs or other things there's an opportunity there for something malicious to get onto your system anyway with FreeBSD you don't get that you get two main ways you can, well, you can download the TAR file, but I don't know how many people that do. There is PKG for the pre-built binary packages, pre-compiled packages, if you wish. And then there's ports. The ports are basically a little script which will go to the, it will automatically fetch the source from the uh, developer's site, apply some free bsd -isms, as it were, and then compile it and install it into your system. You know, and it is safe. It's a lot safer than using PPAs or just downloading blindly, which you should never do. So you've got that, and I say you've got the PKG, which is the pre-compiled uh, packages. And that is the main way you install software in FreeBSD. There's no pretty 
uh, little gooey. Although there is um, Octo PKG, if you really do need a, if you do need a gooey to install something. But you know, you go to PKG search, and part of the keyword for whatever you're looking for, we'll find it. Type PKG info. We'll tell you about it. So on and so forth. So everything you can do, you can do in the command line, and it's catered for in FreeBSD. It's a wonderful, especially, I mean, it was always being good, but since they introduced the PKG uh, N NG for next generation, they, it's been even better. And because FreeBSD, well, I mean, this may change, but it, I hopefully it doesn't. They separate the main base system from the user land. So FreeBSD dash update fetch will fetch the latest security updates for your base system and upgrade it. And then, then FreeBSD hyphen update install will install your updates. You have all the latest security patches and et cetera, et cetera. That's kept separate from your user land, which is seen to by its PKG and port and uh, ports. I use Portmaster because it takes care of the the cleaning up and the install and all the rest and the upgrade. And it just, it just takes care of that. Again, it's not wanting to use the command line to update and install software. Well, you know, you could get away with using the Octo PKG in FreeBSD, but you know, it's a lot quicker just to use, open up the terminal and, and where you go. I think you're really not going to enjoy FreeBSD if you're not going to willing to uh, open up the terminal. It really, you know, it's not Ubuntu. You need to open up that terminal. And some software is seen as slightly older. You know, case of the drivers, the video drivers. Well, you know, older doesn't necessarily mean worse. A lot of some of the older software in FreeBSD, and not a lot of it. This applies, you know. It's not not all the software is old. There's a lot of newer software, and as long as it's getting security fixes and bug fixes, then it really doesn't matter if if it's got. I mean, obviously, if it's missing some uh, features that you want, well, you know, and FreeBSD doesn't scratch that itch, then, you know, moving back to Linux is perhaps the option, or running in VirtualBox, either, you know, run a, a Linux session in VirtualBox, or use Wine. Or, I mean, and I've managed to do this on a couple of occasions, Use uh, the Linuxulator, or Linuxulator, I love that word, which is the Linux ABI, and which allows you to run some uh, Linux software natively as if you were running a FreeBSD version. Then you can have uh, the Linux, if it works for you, then you can have the Linux version, but you know. So because some software is older, it doesn't mean it's any worse. And FreeBSD is not too bad when it comes to uh, the data the software. Like I say, if you're running ports and you're tracking the latest uh, developments, you know, do a port snap, fetch the latest ones, all the latest software is there for you. I mean, I've installed on this system uh, some Plasma, which is even newer than what's just been on Debian 10, which has just been released. I think the Debian 10 one is 5.14 or something like that. I've got 5.16, I think. So, you know. And no PPA support. Well, again, like I said earlier, PPAs, it's um, a great concept. But if you need PPAs in order to fill that gap that's missing from your operating system, then you're doing it wrong. You know, it should be available via um, a tried and trusted repository, either officially or unofficial. I mean, I mean, the Debian one had a multimedia one, I think. I can't remember. I think that, I'm sure it became part of the um, official ones later. But the, that to me is all right. It's more trustworthy. But a random PPA somewhere, oh, I don't know what Ubuntu was thinking when they did that. And it's not a good solution. Anyway, I have, uh, I've talked for a long time and my voice is starting to go. This is a really strange video for me. It was kind of like um, a list. But it ended up as a um, a long monologue, really. Um, I'm not going to be doing this again, or probably not. It's almost like a, a combination of a podcast, a five things, or a uh, monologue. Yes, really strange. Anyhow, that's all I have to say. 
If you think my choices are wrong, which they probably are, and you probably do, then please leave a comment down below. If you liked this content, then please uh, consider subscribing and hit that um, bell notification thing in my bob for uh, latest updates so you don't miss out. And I will see you later and catch you next time. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, then hit that like button. And to make sure you don't miss out, please consider subscribing, as this really helps me help you.